judging is because they want all to accept them just as they are without repentance. And folks can talk about change as much as they want to. Politicians can talk about change. We've had presidents run on a whole platform of change. And you know what usually happens? People don't change. <laughs> that's, that's what usually happens. But the reason the world doesn't like judging is because they want people to accept them just as they are, without repentance, without changing. Now, the sad thing is, is that sometimes, sometimes believers do not like judging either. And they recoil at the whole idea of judging. And the reason, the why behind it, um, may it may pertain to that first one because of course sometimes even we are set, we find ourselves in sin and like everyone else sometimes we don't like to change either but another reason that believers um, do another reason they do not like judging I would suggest is because the temptation is to accept all as they are without repentance I want you to think about that sentence and I think that is the truth of the matter. And what that is, that is at the heart of the ecumenical movement. It is the whole, it is the whole I'm okay, you're okay. And it is probably, folks go that way because it is very non-confrontational. Um, and it does garner larger numbers. When you start telling people what they're doing is not right, people don't like that. And sometimes they leave, just like they left Jesus as well. But to look, at, to look at Matthew chapter 7, an honest person will see what Jesus is teaching. There in verse 5, when he says, Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. He is not saying, let me remove the plank from my, from my eye so that I can ignore the speck in your eye. He's not teaching that. And he's not teaching, let's just remove the speck and the plank altogether and we'll just get along fine. He's not teaching that either. To think about what he's rebuking, which is hypocritical judgment, um, and, and that's an honest person sees that's, that's what's going on. The reason that hypocrisy is so dangerous is because hypocrisy is blinding. To, to think about it, and that's the figure that's, that's being used here. How does a blind person fulfill chapter 6 at verse 33, where it says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness? Well, how does a blind person do that? How does a blind person seek? And I guess the only answer to that would be, well, I guess they seek blindly, because they're certainly not seeing things correctly. Down at verse 6 of chapter 7, do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you in pieces. I was talking with Brother Pedigo um, this morning after the lesson, and we were talking about that concept of sometimes you just have to know when to walk away. This is another one of those passages that shows that principle, where sometimes you have to know when to walk away. Do not cast your pearls before swine. Well, how do you discern someone is like that if you're blind if you're not seeing clearly how do you discern as it talks about the dogs and the swine and, and understand we're talking about people and in its strong language that the lord is using and it's meant to be strong language when he talks in verse 15 beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing inwardly they are ravenous wolves you know that figure of sheep's clothing you remember in the Old Testament when Isaac was old and his eyesight was fading and he had two sons. He had Jacob, he had Esau. And we touched a little bit on it in class. Um, someone mentioned um, what transpired as, as Isaac's wife, as Rebecca, encouraged Jacob to put that goat's hair on his arms and go in and deceive Isaac. And that's exactly what happened. When a person's blind, are they able to recognize the sheep that, or pardon me, the wolf that is in sheep's clothing? They can't do it. So to, to think about it, what it all takes is it takes judgment. It takes good judgment. It takes the ability to see clearly. And as we see clearly, we have an obligation to help others with their problems. 
that's really what the passage is about. That if we have a problem, we need to see to that problem, we need to address that problem, and then once we see clearly, then we can fulfill verse 5 again. Remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Is judgment wrong? See, when you, you have a blanket question like that, the answer has to be no. Now, certainly, hypocritical judgment is wrong. But even with hypocritical judgment, we have to be careful. Um, and I have to pick on someone. When I, when I say this, how would you like it if I stood up here and handed out dietary advice to you? If I handed out weight loss advice? Chuck, how would you like that? Man, Chuck is the most bicycle riding dude. I stopped by his house the other day and he got gotten back from a bike ride. I'm like, Chuck, how far did you ride? You know what he said? It was like 28 miles. I was like, 28 miles? That's crazy. Other, other folks do it. Chuck says, it's not crazy. Chuck, how would you like it if I gave you weight loss tips? Chuck says, not sure if I'm going to buy that one. <laughs> now, here's the point. Could I be right? Could the advice be good advice? It could be, but obviously I'm not taking my own advice. So even with hypocritical judgment, it may be true. It may be true. I'm just not applying it to myself. So even when someone is judging hypocritically, that doesn't necessarily mean what, what is wrong is the hypocrite. The judgment needs to be applied to the, the individual first, and we'll, we'll come back to that. Hypocritical judgment is wrong. Hypercritical judgment is also wrong. Now, to look at those two phrases, hypocritical and hypercritical, not a Greek scholar, all right? But this is real, fairly simple. Um, we're familiar with the, with the a hypodermic needle. Okay, the word hypo, literally what, what it means is under. Okay, that's literally what it means, under or less. Hypocritical judgment is actually not judgmental enough because the individual is not judging themselves. That's where you get into the whole play acting and that, that whole, um, I'm sure you've heard lessons on that before. Hypocritical is not judgmental enough in that sense of the person's not judging themselves. Hypercritical is when a person judges anything and everything. And for a perfect example of that, I'll give you an idea. Um, all preachers use PowerPoint differently, okay? All preachers do. And you want to hear, <laughs> of, of all the ways that, that different preachers use PowerPoint, people have complained before about the font on the PowerPoint. The font. Not what the sermon was about, not on the verses that are used. They complained about the font, and it wasn't just the font size, it was the font color. All right? Hypercritical judgment. In, in more serious matters, if a person starts judging liberties, then it is hypercritical. It is too much judgment. It's judging things that they have no business about. I was talking to someone recently, and they were talking about, um, and it, this person is a Christian, they were talking about someone in the church called them and said, and it was, it was a lady, um, someone called them and said, I don't like how your children are behaving at home. <laughs> and, the, and the person said, wait a minute. You don't like how my children are behaving in my home? And the woman said, yeah, that's right. And the sister said, we need to talk. <laughs> Hypercritical, right? It was, it was taking things too far. Um, so anyway, that, that's just to kind of get us going a little bit. What we're going to do, we're going to look at a chapter. I want you to come over to 1 Corinthians 5 to think about judgment and and I don't like preaching. Um, I don't like preaching on this topic too often. Um, so when I do it, I try to try to make it so it's um, hopefully we understand it. But in First Corinthians five, it, it is it is the chapter, at least one of the chapters about judgment that shows we should never have the sort of attitude. We should never say, like the world says, that we don't believe in judging. 
Because 1 Corinthians 5 very clearly shows we are actually commanded to judge. Let's, I want to go through and I want to just read the 13 verses within the chapter. Verse 1 says, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles that a man has his father's wife. And you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I indeed is absent in body, but present in spirit have already judged as though I were present him who has so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with whole leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with, sex, with sexually immoral people, Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. For what have I to do with judging those also who are outside? Do you not judge those who are inside, but those who are outside, God judges. Therefore, put away from yourselves the evil person. Needless to say, it is not a pleasant chapter, and I understand that. That is probably why many people recoil from judgment, because it is not pleasant. It is not fun. It is not enjoyable. But what we're going to be thinking about for the next few minutes are what would have happened without judgment. That's what we're going to be thinking about within the chapter. And to just get going within the body of the lesson, without judgment, the man likely would have never repented. That's, that's the first thing. We have the advantage and the immense joy of knowing from 2 Corinthians, we know the man ends up turning away from his sin. Leave your marker here in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 because we're going to be coming back to it. But come up to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2 at verse 3, he's talking about the same individual. And the church in Corinth did what they were commanded to do and they ended up... Um, to use the language that was used, they, they ended up um, judging the man and withdrawing from him, and the man ends up repenting. Verse 3 says, And I wrote this very thing to you, lest when I came I should have sorrow over those from whom I ought to have joy, having confidence in you all that my joy is the joy of you all. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote to you with many tears that you should... Uh, Pardon me, not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have so abundantly for you. But if anyone has caused grief, he has not grieved me, but all of you to some extent, not to be too severe. This punishment, which was inflicted by the majority, is sufficient for such a man, so that on the contrary you ought rather to forgive and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. Therefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love to him, for to this end I also wrote that I might put you to the test whether you are obedient in all things. And we'll pause there to think about what was going on. They had withdrawn from the man, and the man was repenting, and they were not taking him back. That was the issue. So when Paul says you need to reaffirm your love towards him, he's not saying... Well, the guy's still doing what he's doing, but you guys need to take him back anyway. That's not, what, that's not what's going on. The man is, has repented. They're not taking him back. And Paul says, you guys need to reaffirm your love to him, and you need to accept him into fellowship once again. Because the man at this point, he was stuck between a rock and a hard place. Here he was. He had been delivered to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. He was outside, okay, 
that same language used in 1 Corinthians 5. He was outside. Now he's trying to come back inside, and they're not letting him in. And that's where he's at. And that's why Paul says what he says. Now, here in this passage, again, it is strong language that is used, and we do ourselves a disservice when, when we have no use for that strong language. Here in verse 6, it is called a punishment. That's, that's what it is called. In 1 Corinthians 5, and don't turn over there, stay here just for another second. In 1 Corinthians 5, Paul says, I have already judged as though I were present, this man who is doing this, this thing. And the church needed to judge the man as well. Here, Paul says, I wrote this, there in verse 9, for to this end I also wrote that I might put you to the test whether you are obedient in all things. When individuals and when congregations do not believe in judgment, and there's a, lot of, there's a lot out there that just flat out don't. When individuals and congregations do not believe in judgment, they are failing that test. Paul says, I wrote to you to put you to the test to see if you would be obedient in all things. And the bottom line is, when we come back and we say, well, we shouldn't judge. We don't believe in judging. We need to read the Bible. We need to read these chapters that we're talking about, and we need to make sure that we're passing the test. Right? That is the language that Paul uses, that the Holy Spirit through Paul uses, and we need to recognize it for what it is. Without judgment, what's the result? The guy never would have repented, okay? Trust me, there were people there in Corinth. The way 1 Corinthians starts, Paul says that it would had been reported by Chloe's household, okay? There were, there, and, and you start seeing why divisions were, why there were divisions in Corinth. I, I don't believe myself that everybody was turning a blind eye to what this guy was doing. I think there were good folks there in Corinth who probably were not turning a blind eye, and they had probably warned the guy and said, it's not right for you to have your father's wife. And what was this guy doing? He's going to do what he wants to do. And he's still going to be a member of that church, and he's still going to assemble with them. And the congregation as a whole was not dealing with it. But the man never, and that's why they had to judge, the man never would have repented, likely, if they had not judged him. What the church in Corinth was doing back in 1 Corinthians 5, what they were doing was chapter 5, verse 2. And you are puffed up. That's what they were. They were puffed up. Verse 6, your glorying is not good. They were glorying. Was it the time to be glorying? It wasn't the right time for that. You see the same thing when you come up to the book of James when it talks about it was time to lament and mourn. It's because when folks find themselves in sin, that's, that's what needs to happen. Here in Corinth, they were ignoring sin. They were, they were ignoring it as a congregation to an extent, and the man needed to wake up. That's what had to happen because he had not woken up yet. He had not come to himself yet. I want to share a story with you. I was talking, talking with a fellow recently, and I asked this fellow if I could share the story, and he said, yeah, by all means. Um, this fellow, when he was younger, and he was a Christian, but he was not living like he needed to live. And he found himself, he was, he was, he found himself just thoroughly caught up in sin and worldliness. And it got to the point where he was not turning away from his sin, and eventually the congregation had to handle it. And the congregation did handle it. And they withdrew from the fella. And the fella, and I'm not, sh I'm not sure how long, I'm not sure how long the fella was out of fellowship, to use that phrase. I'm not sure how long um, it went on before he repented. But I know looking back, that fella said it was the best thing that ever could have happened to him. That's what the fella said. He said that he was just being a rebellious cuss. And it took the church doing what the church needed to do to wake him up. And he finally woke up. And he came back and he repented. And he said it was the best thing that ever happened to him. 
Now, if you want to know who I'm talking about, he's not here tonight. Talk to Jeff, because that's the individual. When he was a member at 10th Street, and like I said, I asked him if I could share that story. I didn't count on him not being here. <laughs> but talk to Jeff. He'll talk to you about it. And it was his quote. He said, it was the best thing that could ever happen to me because he was caught up in sin. And there was a fella during our gospel meeting. There was an older fella. And I'm, I'm sure he shared his name, but I don't recall it right now. But Jeff was sure to introduce him to me. And he said, the fellow who I was talking about, he, he said the man who I, he said, he said one of them who had to deal with that, he said that was that man. That older fella who was a part of the group that had to deal with sin. Undoubtedly, when we talk about judgment and we talk about what it's called in scripture, this punishment, this delivering unto Satan, all of these things, it is horrible and it is painful. No one, no one is doubting that one bit, and no one looks forward to it. But what does judgment bring about? It brings about repentance. That's what it brings about. So I, I would suggest we, we need to be thankful for judgment. We need to be thankful for those who are willing to judge because what they are actually doing is they are looking out for us. They're, they're trying to help us see something that we are having trouble seeing ourselves. So without judgment, the man likely would not have repented. But also, without judgment, the church itself was being caught up in sin. And, and I want you to look back in chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians. Verse 6 again, as it says, Your glory is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Well, what does leaven do? Leaven spreads. That's, that's what it does. The man was not the only one who needed to change. The man was not the only one who needed to repent when it's all said and done. Paul's language here in 1 Corinthians 5, I want you to see who it's, who it's directed to. There in verse 2, and you are puffed up. He's talking to the congregation. You are puffed up. Verse 6, your glory is not good. Right? Verse 8, let us keep the feast. Verse 9, I wrote to you. Who did he write to? Not an individual. He wrote to the church. And, and you see that language. His focus, his focus, frankly, is not really on the man. His focus is on the congregation. The congregation needed to handle this issue that was happening. And Paul states this exact thing. Look over in 2 Corinthians again. Over in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul states this explicitly, that he was not writing as much about the man as he was the congregation. Over in 2 Corinthians 7 at verse 6. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 6 says, Nevertheless, God who comforts the downcast comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not only by his coming, but also by the consolation with which he was comforted in you. When he told us of your earnest desire, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced even more. Did you catch that? Paul says, I rejoiced even more at what? At their earnest desire. Well, that sounds good. At their zeal for him, also good. At their mourning. He rejoiced at their mourning. To look at it, what was happening further on, verse 8. He says, for even if I made you sorry with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. For I perceive that the same epistle made you sorry, though only for a while. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to, repent re pardon me, led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. For observe this very thing, that you sorrowed in a godly manner. What diligent it produced in you. What clearing of yourselves. What indignation. What fear. What vehement desire. What zeal. What vindication. In all things you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Therefore, although I wrote to you, I did not do it for the sake of him who had done the wrong, nor for the sake of him who had suffered wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God 
might appear to you. He did not do it for the man's sake. He did not do it for the father's sake either. He had written for the congregation's sake because the congregation needed to change. That's, that's he says, that's why I wrote it. Now they're, they're in verse 11 again. That figure that's being used, the diligence, right? The clearing of yourselves, the fear, the vehement desire, the indignation, the zeal, the vindication in all things, you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Do you want, do we want this congregation to be like that? Right? All of those things, the desire, the zeal, the vindication. Do we want this congregation, this local congregation, do we want this congregation to be like that? That's why judgment is important. To think about it, it does not happen. You do not get to verse 11 without judging. This is the reward. This is, this is the, the joy, if you will. Here is the joy. Here is the comfort. It uses those figures within, within this context. You have all of those good attributes, and, and we recognize that, and, and we want the church to be like that. 1 Corinthians 5 is the danger, right? 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 7, that's the reward when judgment happens and when people repent. The congregation needed to change. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, that's the warning. That's the warning. And when Paul talks about it there in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and he says, I wrote to you because I do not want to come to you sorrowfully. And he was rejoicing because he had heard of their mourning. He had heard that they had repented, that the congregation had changed, and they had dealt with this issue. The congregation in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, they were glorying, and they were puffed up, and they were turning a blind eye to sin. They weren't, they weren't doing what they needed to do. And the warning is this, whole congregations can be swallowed up in sin. And if you want, if you want to see that in an application, go up and read Revelation. Read the first few chapters in Revelation. And you will see whole congregations caught up in sin. That's what happens with leaven. Leaven leavens the whole lump. That is why judgment is so important. Without judgment, frankly, the church is no different than the world. Back in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, there in verse 12, says, For what have I to do with judging those also who are outside? Do not judge those who are inside. But those who are outside, God judges. Therefore, put away from yourselves this evil person. He talks about, he says, I wrote to you not to keep company with sexually immoral people and covetous and extortioners. And he says, I'm not talking about the world. He said, if you're going to keep away from, from those people, you're going to have to leave the world. <laughs> okay? He, he says, no, I'm talking about the church and, and individuals within the church. And he uses that figure of inside, right? He says, do you not judge those who are inside? Outside, God judges. Without judgment, without judgment, the church is no different than the world when it's, when it's all said and done. Hopefully, we are not surprised. Um, when you look out into the world, here, here's, your, here's your deep thought for the day. You ready for it? This is going to be really profound. Get ready for it. You're, you might want to write this down in your Bible. The world is worldly. Wow, that's a newsflash, isn't it? <laughs> wow, you mean, you mean worldly people are, are in the world? Yes. <laughs> yeah. The world is worldly. We should not be surprised by that. Without judgment, what happens to the church? it becomes worldly. That's, that's what ends up happening. I want you to come up to 1 Peter chapter 4. Another passage that mentions judgment. 1 Peter chapter 4 at verse 14. 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 14. 1 Peter 4 verse 14 says, If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part he is blasphemed, but on your part he is glorified. 
But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Judgment begins at the house of God. Outside, outside God judges. All of this ties in, all this idea of judging, it, it all ties in with what Jesus said himself back in, back in the Gospel of John. Come back to John 12. As judgment begins, right, the time for judgment begins at the house of God. What does that mean? It, I, and I think it means what we've been talking about. If any man speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. We have the truth. The world, the world has no use for the truth. So, in that sense, they are not applying the truth to themselves. Obviously, the world is worldly. But we, hopefully, are applying the truth. And in that, we have what Jesus says in John chapter 12. Look at verse 48. John 12, verse 48. Oh, actually, verse 47. And if anyone hears, and if anyone hears, my words and does not believe I do not judge him for I did not come to judge the world but to save the world that sounds good doesn't it oh people will pull that verse out of context won't they oh see what Jesus said he says he does not judge people I did not come to judge the world but to save the world that sounds oh, oh I feel so much better about things right now <laughs> do not make Jesus say and mean something he did not mean. Read the next verse. Verse 48. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. The closer a person comes to the gospel, the closer they come to that which judges them. The world has no use for the gospel. So the first time they're going to hear about judgment, unfortunately, is going to be on judgment day when every knee shall bow. And at that point, it's just going to be too late, unfortunately. But here, as, as we think about judgment and we think about righteous judgment, when a person hears the word, right, receives the word, and applies the word, we have that as we think about the idea. This is what we're talking about when we think about things like righteous judgment. This is what marks the difference between the church and the world. The world doesn't care about the Bible. right? We sang a song just a little bit ago about the Bible. The world does not care about the Bible. Hopefully we're, hopefully we're different. And we'll say this. I wasn't sure if I wanted to share this story or not, so pardon me for if, if you think this is inappropriate. Lily was at school this past week. We had a conversation yesterday in social studies, and pardon me, Lily, for sharing this story. <laughs> they're in social studies, and they were talking about, and it doesn't matter what they were talking about. The teacher played a song for them, and then the teacher asked, well, what does that song mean to you? And what the teacher was talking about was religion and how different people have different ideas about religion. So... The teacher plays the song, and the song was a song from the 1960s called The House of the Rising Sun. Now, I'm kind of glancing around the room because I want to see if anybody knows what that song's about. Chuck knows what that song's about. The teacher never told the kids what the song was about. But the teacher said, oh, what do you think the song was about? And got all sorts of different answers. And I had to share with Lily what the song's about. The song's about a brothel in New Orleans. It's about prostitution, and it's about a fellow who's caught up in it. Now, do you think any of those kids guess that? No. So the, teacher, the teacher's point was, well, that's how religion is. Everybody has different ideas about what the Bible means. And I said, Lily, I said, if you want to know what that song's about, who do you think you should ask? And we, she kind of went oh, back and forth a little bit. And finally she said, well, I guess you would ask the person who wrote it. And I said, you got it. You go to the source. 
And that's what we do. We go to the source. The Bible is not open to interpretation. It's not open to, well, I think it means this, and I think it means that, and I think, no, 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 no. We want to know what the Lord intended it to mean. We read it, we study it, and we have to rightly divide it. And as we do that, as we do that, we become different than the world. Without judgment, the, the church is no different than the world. Now, I know the response that usually happens. Well, who am I to judge? Well, hopefully we are those who know better, when it is what it ultimately comes down to. We, we should know better, and we are, we are able to share God's love and God's law. Right? Precepts and promises, law and love combining. We are those who should know better, and we should be able to share those things. But I want you to consider an, another principle. Come back to 1 Corinthians, this time 1 Corinthians 6. As we think about, well, who am I to judge? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, look at the first five verses. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 1. Dare any of you, and I understand there's a little bit of a topic change, but just bear with me. It says, dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Uh-oh, we're still talking about judging, aren't we? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then you have judgments concerning things pertaining to this life, do you appoint those who are least esteemed by the church to judge? I say this to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you, not even one, who will be able to judge between his brethren, but brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. Like I said, I understand another topic is being addressed, and it would take a whole other lesson to talk about saints judging the world, as well as saints judging angels. But in a certain sense, while it is a different topic, that they were actually suing one another, dragging each other into courts, things like that, it is another topic, but at the same time, we're still talking about judgment. And the principle that I wanted you to see is that one there in verse 5 when he says, Is there not a wise man among you who will be able to judge in these matters? And that's, that's the principle. So when we come back and we say, well, who am I to judge? The wise are able to judge. To think about what's going on here, and go ahead and come up to Hebrews chapter 5. To think about judging... And the wise being able to judge up in Hebrews chapter 5 at verse 12. Hebrews 5 verse 12 says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. Hebrews 5 verse 13, For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. That word for discernment there comes from the exact same Greek word as judging. Right? It's the same word that we keep looking at over and over. And it's that idea of discerning between good and evil. Right? That's what it's talking about. Right? It's judging between good and evil. Not everybody is able to discern between good and evil. That's what that passage says. Those who partake only of milk, they are unskilled in the word of righteousness, and they are babes. Sometimes people are in that position through no fault of their own. Do you expect, we, we do not expect, if someone is a new convert, if someone is a brand new convert, fresh from the waters of baptism, do we really expect them to have their senses exercised to ultimately discern between all things good and evil? Like, No, they're still growing. I think they have a little bit of discernment because they've obeyed the gospel. But if they are babes in Christ, then they are babes in Christ. Whether it is, whether it is not their fault, if they're just spiritually immature or young, or if they have kind of not come along like they needed to, which is what this passage is talking about. But solid food, solid food belongs to those who are of full age. Those, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern 
again, same root word as judge, to discern both good and evil. Those who are able to discern, those who are seeing clearly, to go all the way back to where we began, those who are seeing clearly, not only can they judge, they actually have a responsibility to judge because they are seeing clearly. You go all the way back to Genesis, and what do you have? You have Cain and Abel. And there Cain was, and Cain killed his brother. The Lord comes along, and what's Cain say? Am I my brother's keeper? You know what the answer to that question is? Yes, that's the answer. If we are seen clearly, then we have a responsibility to others to help them. And that's, that's what we're talking about. And I hope, as we start wrapping things up, I hope that we do not despise the chastening of, of God. Look over in Hebrews chapter 12, where that phrase comes from. Over in Hebrews chapter 12 at verse 5. Hebrews 5 at verse 12 says, And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. What does love do? What does love do? According to that verse. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens. That's what love does. Love chastens. To think about that verse, um, and, and let me ask a, a simple question. Is rebuking sin discouraging? That's a little bit of a trick question. <laughs> Is rebuking sin discouraging? Yeah, it's discouraging sin. That's what it's supposed to do. But at the same time, it's two sides of a coin. Is, is chastening, is chastening and is, as you think about the idea of rebuking, while it is discouraging sin, what is it encouraging? It's encouraging repentance. It's encouraging obedience. Those are good things. If I come along and, sorry Chuck, you get picked on again. If Chuck finds himself in sin, and I just come along and give him an attaboy and a pat on the back, and I say, Chuck, you're a great fella. You're doing everything just right. Keep going just the way you're going. And he's going right into a minefield of sin. Well, wow, John sure is an uplifting guy. I really appreciate that encouragement. Kaboom. <laughs> right? And I really did you a great service there, didn't I? By not warning you. By not rebuking by not chastening, by not doing all these things. The problem is that folks have so much trouble with judgment and they don't understand that judging, judging righteously is a good thing. Hypocritical judgment, that's not a good thing. Like we said, and I won't rehash that, hypercritical judgment, that is also not a good thing. And there are all matters, and I think that might be part of the problem. A lot of times folks engage in hypercritical judgment. Um, and there are a myriad of examples that folks could use. But for those, uh, I'll say this, for those, for those in our lives who are willing to judge righteously, and I'll just speak for myself, I am thankful for them. And I've shared a little bit of this before, but I'll say it again. I'm thankful for my mom and dad. Because when I found myself as wrong as I could be, you know what my mom and dad did? They told me I was wrong. <laughs> and they were not going to tolerate me doing wrong. And if I was going to keep doing wrong, then I knew where the door was. They were not going to allow it in, under their roof as it is. So for those who judge with righteous judgment, let me, let me back up and put it this way. That man in Corinth, that man who found himself as lost as he could be, frankly. How thankful do you think he was for judgment? He came back to the Lord. He came back to the church. And not in hypocrisy. That was the problem before. He was playing the hypocrite. 
he was taking there in first Corinthians chapter 5 it talks about let us not keep the feast with such things um, look back in that passage back in first Corinthians 5 let us keep the feast not with old leaven nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth that man was assembling with them and was partaking of the Lord's Supper and he was doing it all hypocritically. He found himself in sin. I'm thankful for those who are willing to judge righteously because they actually encourage people to repent. Come up to 1 Corinthians 11, then the lesson's yours. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And as we read, these, as we read this passage, just think about folks who say, oh no, it's not our place to judge that we shouldn't judge, that judgment has no place. Um, of all the passages of all the passages we've looked at, hopefully I've showed, hopefully we've seen the error of that mentality. But in verse 29 of 1 Corinthians 11, for he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this, many, for this reason, many are weak and sick among you and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. I do not want to be condemned with the world. And I do not want you to be condemned with the world. And that's why judgment matters. That's, that's, why, that's why we're talking about what we're talking about. How do we avoid being condemned with the world? We judge. We judge before judgment. If we wait until Judgment Day, we've just, waited, we've just waited too long. So as we offer the invitation, we'll simply ask this question. Are you willing to judge yourself? Right? And that's ultimately what a person has to do. They have to judge themselves. Doesn't mean that they, doesn't mean that they judge themselves outside of Scripture. It means they apply Scripture to themselves. And that's, that's what has to happen. So as we offer the invitation, will you judge yourself? Will you judge yourself by the word? And will you judge yourself before judgment day? Before ultimately we stand at the judgment seat of Christ. We're thankful that the Lord sits there now and we can come to him and we find mercy. That's what we find. But without judgment, if we do not judge ourselves, then we find ourselves condemned. The lesson is yours. If you're here tonight and need to respond, please come while we stand and while we sing the invitation.